So tonight to tell us about a successful co-op story is uh, our CEO of the Gig Trust and one of the founding members of Gig. I had the privilege of meeting him in 2011 when we've just uh, started the bank by faith, run it on an Excel spreadsheet and he joined uh, thinking that we were up and running only to find out we know nothing what, uh, about banking whatsoever. And just from the questions you ask, I realize he's the man for the job. And fortunately for me in 2012, he took up the reins of steering us. And then by 2015, we had our bank. Okay, so um, I've got 10 minutes. If, uh, is that right, Jasper? Yes, go for it. Okay, so let me see if I can quickly do this in 10 minutes. So um, I'm quickly just going to do an overview of cooperatives and then specifically look at one international example of a cooperative movement. So um, I really enjoy the concept of, of cooperatives uh, and a trend that uh, you might also have seen is that there's a movement from globalization to localism. Okay, and this is due to a number of things. Uh, government failures, not just in South Africa, but really uh, worldwide, you know, governments are failing at uh, different levels. And then also technology uh, enables us to do things on a local level and on a smaller level. We don't need the type of economies of scale that we used to need in the past. Uh, actually one can start very sustainable ventures uh, on a much smaller scale than than previously so so just think about i'll, I'll give a few examples energy uh, we don't need a massive uh, madupi or kuseli power station uh, you put 10 solar panels on your roof uh, and an inverter and batteries and and there you go um, education, uh, you know, that can all be done online these days. When we speak about food, uh, you know, think of, for example, aqu aquaponics. Um, uh, you know, you don't even really need land for food. As an interesting example, the Netherlands is the second biggest food exporter in the world, and they've got a terrible climate, those of you that know the Netherlands, but they do everything, all the uh, agriculture basically in uh, greenhouses. So got these huge, uh, looks like factories out of the air, but it's basically glass uh, structures where they do their, their farming. Uh, hotels uh, or accommodation, Airbnb. If we think of money, uh, cryptocurrencies, the blockchain, so so technology is a, a big driver when it comes to localism. Um, another way to put it is that we are moving from centralized systems to decentralized systems. So usually when we hear this word centralized, we think, okay, this is communist, Marxist, but that's not necessarily the truth. Even in highly capitalist societies, if we look at the money systems, uh, whether it's the European Union or the United States, uh, the money systems are actually very centralized because it's controlled by a central bank. 100 uh, years ago, that was not the case. Uh, during the days of free banking, you actually had commercial banks issue money, not central banks. Um, and we have very few examples of that today. Hong Kong is one, one uh, example and one exception where there's three banks that actually produce the notes in circulation, not a central bank. Okay, so uh, centralized systems aren't uh, reserved for communist or Marxist uh, countries. We find this also in the capitalist world or the so-called free market world. Um, which is not so free always. There's a lot of maneuvering and centralized planning and control, but all of that, uh, there's really a trend for that coming to an end. And I think in a big way, blockchain as a technology 
is going to be the thing that leads us into decentralized systems. Um, and then for those of you that might have been following the news on the coronavirus, we can already see the failure in the, what is called the just-in-time system in terms of supply chains, uh, where you know components for iPhones that are made in, in China or the, the um, essential ingredients in medicines that are manufactured in India but come from China, all of that, uh, those supply chains are busy freezing up. Um, and so there's a, a real threat that globalization you know, is, is coming to an end. But for us, it's really good news. Uh, uh, and I think cooperatives is a, a fantastic vehicle to use to drive localism. So what is a cooperative? Basically, it's a self-help organization. It balances the profit motive with member benefits. So where a company is usually uh, purely profit-driven, a cooperative says, yes, we need to uh, be sustainable, but our aim of existence is to help ourselves and to provide members with benefits. It works on a one-man, one-vote system, and there's a strong focus on retaining reserves. So with a company, there's a strong focus on uh, giving dividends uh, to your shareholders, um, not retaining reserves. And uh, yeah, cooperative is great just for community-based solutions. Okay, seven principles. I'm not going to elaborate on them, but uh, it's a democratic organization. Um, uh, member economic participation is a really important element. So if you think of Geek CFI, uh, those of you that are members, you are not just clients of the CFI, you are actually shareholders. Uh, you have a say. Uh, in in how the the cooperative is managed and run and what products you uh, uh, you know can avail of there's a strong focus on education concern for the community and also cooperation amongst cooperatives so this this is i think where cooperatives differ in a big way from companies uh, in usual businesses the focus is competition in cooperatives, the focus is, as the name says, on cooperating. So I'm going to give you a success story of a, a cooperative movement in Spain. Uh, if you look here on the presentation, this little red region in Spain uh, is called the Bosque region or country. Um, and... Uh, in that area, there is a movement called Mondragon, and it consists of 266 cooperatives with uh, over 80,000 members. If you had to take all of these cooperatives as a single business, they would have the seventh or eighth biggest turnover in the whole of Spain. Now, Spain has got a, a big economy, so this is not small. Uh, what they are doing. So how did this start? In the 1950s, um, uh, a Catholic priest with his youth group uh, started the first cooperative. So Spain was just coming out of a civil war and they had very high levels of unemployment. Um, and from the establishment of that first cooperative, uh, many cooperatives were subsequently uh, started in, in that uh, area. So um, there's just a, a number of, of firms, uh, but there's 266 of, of them. So they've got cooperatives in banking, insurer, insurance, uh, automotive components, transport services, agriculture, health services, medical equipment manufacturing, packaging, construction, manufacturing, robotics, electronics. Um, it's, it's really a wide field of industries where uh, they are involved. 
Now, what is so impressive about the Mondegrin movement is that uh, through every financial crisis, uh, they hardly, if ever, need to lay off workers. So, so if you remember what I said uh, earlier, that within cooperatives, there's a, a, a desire or, or to accumulate reserves, um, not to to declare all your profits as as dividends and uh, release it to your shareholders. So cooperatives tend to be well capitalized. So whenever there's a financial crisis, they sit on big reserves. They can continue to still pay salaries, even if their own business uh, is in a downturn cycle. That is not, not a problem. Um, it's not so cutthroat like you would find in a pure equity-based uh, company that goes through the business cycle of retrenchment, employing people, retrenching, employing. This does not happen in, in properly managed cooperatives. And Mondragon is a good, good example. You also have very few labor problems because... Uh, your workers aren't just workers, they are actually owners. They are shareholders of those businesses. Then also in terms of uh, fairness and equality, um, on average, these businesses have a one to five uh, wage ratio. So what that means is the, the uh, top position in a cooperative would not earn more than five times that of the lowest paid worker. Um, so uh, that, that's also something to, to uh, th think about. So it's a much more sustainable uh, model. Um, okay, so, so if we, we look at the South African context. Uh, we have the Cooperatives Act of 2005. There was recently an amendment to that act. Um, and prior to 2005, South Africa only had agricultural co-ops. Today, uh, there's different legislation regulating, for example, banking and housing cooperatives. Uh, we still have agricultural cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, producer cooperatives, uh, worker cooperatives. And to start, start such an entity, you need five members, a constitution, you register with SIPC, um, and then you have an annual general meeting. Uh, so, yeah, going forward, uh, where I, I see the opportunity is in areas like healthcare, and, and we can have later on some sessions uh, you know, worldwide, uh, there are many health cooperatives that cater for the, the health needs of the population. So um, even with the challenges we might face with the health in future, here's a, a business opportunity, energy. Um, an example in Mapumalanga is uh, the Desmond Tutu Foundation. They've got uh, solar panel cooperatives. Um, yeah, and one can get very creative with this. Housing cooperatives. Uh, speaking of unemployment, uh, I often see people retire uh, or their business is not as profitable Sorry, as it used to be. And instead of just closing down that business, uh, one model is to allow the workers to do a buyout of the business and from future profits, uh, pay uh, for for that uh, buyout. Um, so, yeah, instead of increasing the unemployment numbers and just closing a business, give the workers an opportunity to buy it out and convert it into a cooperative. So, I think my ten minutes is over. Thank you, Jasper.